All right. Well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Well, don't be too excited to be here. All right. So a couple of announcements I have for you guys. Um, we are looking for pie bakers. We need pies for the chili cook-off on November 18th. And uh, we're going to auction off the pies to raise money for the Guatemala trip. And so if, if you say, well, I'm good at baking, I'd bake a pie. Um, see Pastor Julie afterwards. She's got my son back there. So uh, I am playing dad mom this week. So uh, I'm so glad for uh, grandma mom because I have a uh, <coughs> little bit of help. So we're doing good. We're doing good. So, But if you're here and you say, I can cook a pie, see her, um, all the proceeds will go to uh, going to Guatemala where we're going to be doing projects in the children's home as well as doing pastors conferences and going out into the community and loving on the pastors which we're really excited about so so make sure you see that and then uh quick missions update uh my wife comes home in 10 hour uh, 10 days 20 hours 43 minutes and 20 seconds <laughs> i've got a countdown <laughs> But who's counting? Apparently me. Um, and so they, uh, they got uh, traveled for 34 hours. They left uh, Monday morning at 1 a.m. And they arrived uh, in India on Tuesday. At, um, they got to the hotel at like 1130 um, a.m. So it was like 34 hours they were traveling for. And... Uh, it's funny because uh, Crystal said they got to their hotel room. I, I did get to talk to her in Baghdad, and um, she uh, uh, said that, um, not Baghdad, Hyderabad, thank you. She's not in Baghdad. <laughs> <laughs> that mission trip went really wrong. Um, Hyderabad, thank you. I was like, that didn't sound right. Hyderabad, thank you. They, they uh, are in Hyderabad. And uh, the funny thing was is that so they get there. They're in this uh, hotel. There's no AC. It's 90 degrees. And Steve and Ken are sharing a double bed. <laughs> so anytime I get sad, I'm missing my wife, I just think of Steve and Ken in a double bed at 90 degree, super humidity, awesome. So... Yeah, could not be any better, so that's really fun. And so I got to talk to Crystal. They were heading three hours south of Hyderabad. And so I looked on the map where they would be, and we did buy a, uh, an Apple tag. But anytime you're near anyone that would have an iPhone, it would bing, and we'd know where she was. But this is how crazy it is. They're three hours south of that. And so I got looking, and I mean, there's nothing. So I, I found on Google Maps how long, how far you could go, a three-hour drive, and literally there's nothing there. And so wherever they stayed uh, last night, uh, they obviously didn't have Wi-Fi, and so that could be their hub for a while where they go out and back and forth, and so we may not hear from them for a couple days. So, uh, but that's, uh, we, we knew that going into it, and so... Um, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, you when God has called you to do something, and my wife definitely has a calling on her life to for missions and to preach the gospel, and so how could you say no, you know? And so we prayed about it, and I had a piece about it. I'm like, I'm not worried at all, but even if something did happen, how could you stand before God and ask for the one person back when the thousands are hearing about Jesus? And so she told me that uh, last time she went, they would go and because they'd never see white people, let alone a, a white, blonde, blue-eyed woman. So they come out in the, th in the hundreds, you know. And um, she said that it's, you kind of, based on the size of our church and the sanctuary, they would look and see, and they'd be like, there's about 200 people. And, uh, and they said it's easier to just account who didn't accept Jesus because it's just the masses accept Jesus. So... So she's had, yeah, so she's had one day of ministry already. Uh, I'm going to say uh, probably a couple hundred people have already gotten saved. So that's, that's what I'm believing God for. We'll find out when I hear from her. And um, she will be waking up any moment now and uh, heading off to another day of ministry. They are 11 and a half hours difference from us. So literally on the other side of the planet. So, 
So yeah, so it's exciting stuff. I want to say, me and my wife would like to say thank you to everybody. You know, this we had pastor appreciation, and uh, I asked that you know we knew what we were getting into when we signed up for ministry, but our kids didn't sign up for it. So I just said, hey, bless my kids, don't bless me. And uh, it's been a really cool week, you know, to be able to sit my kids down and be like, hey, because they they got toys this week and stuff, and we just said, hey. Um, do you know why you've got these gifts? And so you're able to tell them, like, the church is really thankful that you spend so much time at church and allow mommy and daddy to do their job. And so we wanted them to love that mom and dad work at a church, not hate it, you know? And so I just want to say thank you. It's been so cool to just be able to explain that to them and watch their faces light up and the, the, um, the candy and the uh, and then we're excited because they got like movie ticket passes and you know all kinds of stuff. So they're really excited, and um, and so I just want to say thank you. It's been a blessing to us to be able to bless our kids, and so we're uh, all just the little gifts added up, and uh, we're going to uh, in March we're going to go and on a little family vacation. Elijah always want for his birthday. All he wants to do is stay in a hotel. I don't know. He, he loves hotels. And so we're actually going to give him that birthday gift this year. So thank you. Uh, we appreciate just loving on my kids. It means a lot to me that you guys would do that. So thank you. All right. So let's just pray over God's word tonight. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Father, we say let the word of the Lord sound forth, whether it be here or in India. And so. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> so, we're on Genesis 43. The title of the sermon tonight is Pursuing the Face of Jesus and Protecting the Father's Heart. And so... You know, quick recap, we saw Simeon was uh, just left in prison, you know. Uh, uh, Joseph says, hey, if you really are who you say you are, um, leave your bro- leave, leave uh, one of your brothers here. And he selects Simeon, and they all leave. And he says, "If you uh, bring back Benjamin, and if you bring back Benjamin, then you can have your brother back. And so Jacob's like, no, I, you ain't taking uh, Benjamin. And so they just leave him there. Like, and as we read for this passage, I'm like, I can just see, like, me and my sisters, like, are you guys kidding me? You left me here? Like, my sister Heather would never do that, but Faith might. Okay, so I'm just letting you know. And so, uh, no, I'm just kidding. She probably wouldn't either. She'd be the, the, the one fighting to get me back. But I'm like, this is craziness. And they just leave him there. And so uh, in uh, chapter 43, verse 1, it says, uh, but the famine continued to ravage the land of Canaan when the grain they had bought from Egypt was almost gone. Jacob said to his sons, go back and buy a little more food. Well, hold on a second. So they, they leave him there, and now all the food they got is almost gone. And so we don't know how long it's been, but they've come from another country, and they didn't fly in a plane or drive in cars. So it's probably like a couple weeks travel one way, right? in a couple weeks back, and you wouldn't do that for, you know, the week's worth of groceries. So they probably have months worth of food. So I don't know how long he's been in there, but it's been months, if not longer, okay? And so it goes on and says, but Judah said, the man was serious when he warned us, you won't see my face. Okay, underline that. You won't See my face again, unless your brother is with you. For you send, uh, if you send Benjamin with us, we will go down and buy more food. But if you don't let Benjamin go, we won't go either. Remember, the man said, you won't see my face, underline that, again, unless your brother is with you. Why are you so cruel to me, Jacob moaned? Why did you tell them you had a brother? And so we remember the rule of repetition. When God's word repeats itself, he's trying to get a point across to us. And so fundamental truth here is that obedience 
is not contingent upon whether or not you agree or want to do it. Young people in the room. Obedience is not contingent on whether or not you agree or want to do it. And so, you know, so many people follow God when it's easy. So many people follow God as long as it's the way they want it to look or the way they think it should be. But that's not obedience. And so the brothers are given specific instructions by Joseph, who is a type and shadow of Jesus. There is only one way to see his face and receive the life-giving grain. If you want to see his face, obedience is required. Obedience is your blank. Obedience is required. And so... Verse 7, the man kept asking us questions about our family, they replied. He asked, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? So we answered his questions. How could we, how would we know he would say, bring your brother down here? Judah said to his father, send the boy with me, and we will be on our way. Otherwise, we will die of starvation. And not only we, but all. You and your little ones, I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible. If I don't bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we, haven't, if we hadn't wasted all this time, we could have gone and returned twice by now. So already we can kind of see the time frame here. We could have traveled to this other country back again. And came back again. Like, so we're looking at probably at least, if it was two weeks of travel, we're looking at at least two, two months here. And so if we would have only obeyed sooner, we would have received double the blessing by now. How much time do we waste? How many blessings have we missed because we are slow to being obedient? Now, it wouldn't be Wednesday night if I didn't make everybody uncomfortable. How much blessings have we missed because we're not obedient with tithing? No? Too soon? Okay, we won't talk about that tonight. Are we slow to obedience? So the question is, who, slow, who sold Joseph into slavery? Let's take a look. Genesis 37, let's recap. Verse 26, Judah, Judah's your blank. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We would have, we'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. So jo uh, Judah sold Joseph with no regard for the heart of the father. Heart is your blank. He, he, no regard for the heart of the, the father. He knew that, 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 that Joseph was his favorite. I mean, literally, it was the, his firstborn son of the love of his life, and they knew how much he meant to his father, and, and they, they sold him with no regard for his father's heart. And so, just a quick recap. In Genesis 6, verse 5 and 6, we saw this when it came to uh, flooding the earth. And the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was constantly and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Broke is your blank. It broke his heart. See, a lot of times we don't think of, of God being able to break God's heart. We, we don't think of God that way. Especially when we're not living in obedience. Well, God is love. No, no. When we're not obedient, it breaks the Father's heart. And so, how often do we do things with no regard for the heart of the Father? Do our actions break the Father's heart? And we saw after this that Judah sells Joseph with no regard for the Father's heart. And then we saw the little side journey he took. Remember that in, in chapter 38, I think it was? And he takes this side journey, and he goes off, on, and all this horrible stuff happens to him. He experienced heartbreak himself. He experienced his life outside of the promises of God. And so sometime between uh, selling Joseph into slavery and now he has gone, done that whole thing, and now Judah is back, okay? And so we see here 
that he now has returned and Judah takes responsibility for Benjamin. Now Judah is protecting the heart of the father. See, his old life, he, he did things with no regard for the father's heart. And now in, in this new life, he's back. He's gone. He did his thing. He realized he was wrong. He's come back. And now he's, his actions and the things he says, he's saying, I'm going to put the heart of the father before m- myself. And so point number two tonight is protecting the father's heart means putting his interests above your own, his and own or your blank. Putting his interests above your own. And so, you know, how, how often do we make a sacrifice for the Lord? How often do we put his interests? How often do our actions protect the heart of the father? You know, you could it could have easily been like, dude, the world has gone nuts. Let's not go to India. Let's not do it. And how many hundreds, if not thousands of people won't hear about Jesus? Because my interest was higher than his. See, we have to be willing to say, okay, let's put the interests of the father before my own. Let's further the kingdom first. That is what is most important. And so they are rich. If you remember, they are very rich, yet they're starving. He says, he says, send a boy with me. Otherwise, we're going to die. And not only us, but our little kids are going to die too. They are rich. They are a very rich family, and they are starving. They are very rich, but it won't save them. And so the seven years of plenty is a type and shadow of the last church age. Last church age is your blank. We are living right now in the time of plenty. Think about it. Think about like uh, your grandparents, what they had, and think about what my four-year-old son has now. We are living in a time of plenty. We are in the final church age, and, and, uh, but in the age of plenty, in that church age, we saw in our Revelation study the, the uh, church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea was the, the lukewarm church. Who was a part of that study? Anybody in here? Part of the study? Okay. For you guys that won't, uh, you can go back and watch that. Um, but quick recap, Laodicea was the wealthiest city of its time, and it gained its wealth from banking, It was a financial center of the Roman Empire. And number two, black wool. Black is your your blank there. Black wool. It was known for fashion. And number three, medicine. It was the medical center of the Roman Empire. And Aristotle actually wrote about Laodicea and its eye medicine. So eye is your blank. He, He wrote about, they were famous for their eye medicine. And so we saw in Revelation 3.17, you say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing, and you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, we saw that Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded, blinded is your blank, the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. And so they are unable to see the face of Jesus. They are unable to pursue the face of Jesus because they are spiritually blind. And we look at our our nation today, how spiritually blind it is. And so it went on in Revelation 3.18, so I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Jesus says, you're not rich. You might be the richest city in the Roman Empire, but you are not rich. You have to buy what I have. See, see, uh, uh, Jacob and, and, and his family are very wealthy, but it will not save them. And so the first thing Jesus tells Laodicea to buy from him is gold purified by fire. So some of this is a recap if you were in the Revelation study. So 1 Peter 1, 7, these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. 
Through your faith, uh, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through the tri- many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. James writes about it. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind. Why? Why? Why would that be joy? We don't want to sit there and be like, "Yes, we're being persecuted." Ha 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 ha! That's not what it's talking about. But what happens is it's uh, um, anyone ever had one like the uh, life proof box or the the uh, the the auto the otter box on your phone? You know, no, I mean maybe you do, I, not me. I, I I one time I had a life proof box, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be cool. You can take pictures underwater. Yeah, I didn't put my phone in water. I wasn't gonna do it, but it wasn't until you know you're playing games. And you drop it in the toilet or something, right? <laughs> okay. And you pull it out and you're like, yes, it still works. Do you see what I'm saying? When you fe- face trials of many kinds and your faith pushes you through, you're like, yes, it works. That's where the joy comes in. The trial tests your faith and you purify like gold and you begin to take on what Jesus has for you instead of trying to make it on your own riches that can't save you. See, gold is melted down to separate the impurities and trials will test your faith in the same way. You know, we talked about this in the Revelation series that hard times create strong believers. You know, when we went through, through COVID, man, we, we were praying an hour a day because nobody had anywhere to, no, nowhere to go and nothing to do. So all the young people would just come to the amp, and we had sometimes up to like 25 people there every day praying for an hour. See, hard times create strong believers. Strong believers create good times. Good times create lazy, lukewarm believers, and lazy, lukewarm believers create hard times. And then guess what? Hard times create strong believers again. Strong believers create good times. Good times create lazy, lukewarm believers. And lazy, lukewarm believers create hard times. And round and round we go. And so, in Revelation 3.18, Jesus says, Also buy white garments from me, so you will not be ashamed of your nakedness. So the second thing that Jesus says to this uh, uh, um, last church age, this, this age of plenty, he says, buy white garments, white garments. And so the white garments, quick, this is, a, again, still a recap from Revelation. Uh, white garments is impossible to keep clean. I mean, I, I, I love my white, like, high tops, but, man, I am still trying to figure out how to clean them. You can't keep them clean? It's impossible. I mean, I even bought a bleach pen. It doesn't work. Does not work. And so black wool would hide all the stains. And so they, they, this lukewarm age of plenty was famous for their, their fashion, for their black wool, their ability to hide all the stains, to hide all the sin. And Jesus says, buy what I have for you so you won't have to be ashamed and hide all the sin. See, white would show everywhere that you've been. But black leaves no trace. Nobody knows. I can do whatever I want. And so white garments signify two things. Number one, we're going to get back to Genesis, I promise. Number one, justification. Justification is his doing. His is your blank. He makes us righteous. He makes us right. It's by his grace. But it also signifies sanctification. And sanctification is our doing. Ours are blank. Our doing. We have to choose to be set apart. You have to choose to say, okay, I will be obedient. Okay, I will protect the heart of the Father. And so... We are living in the last church age, the age of plenty. And so in, in uh, Gen- last week we saw in, in Genesis 42, 34, it says, but you must bring your youngest brother back to me. Then I will know you are honest men, not spies. Then I will give you back your brother and you may trade freely in the land. See, obedience will give them 
full access to everything Joseph has to offer. And I'm excited here in a few weeks, a few chapters, we're going to look at, we're going to put how rich Joseph was in modern day standards. So we can get a concept of how rich he became or how rich he made Pharaoh. And he says, if you are obedient and come back, you will have full access to everything I have. It's, you can come, you can trade, you can come and go. Everyone's starving to death out there, but you can come and get whatever you need. If you want, if you want life, if you want the justification his doing, then we have to pursue the sanctification our doing. We have to choose to be set apart. Obedience is required. And so in Revelation 18, uh, Revelation 3, 18 and 19, Jesus says, and an ointment for your eyes so that you'll be able to see. So the third thing that Jesus told Laodicea to buy from him is eye ointment. Eye is your blank. And so we saw in Ephesians 1, 17 that God uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that what are the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints. See, do we, have, do we have spiritual eyes that see the heart of the Father and pursue, his fa- pursue the face of Jesus? And if we want to see the face of Jesus, obedience is required in this last church age, in this age of plenty. We need to buy from him the white garment. We need to buy from him the gold that's purified and have spiritual eyes that can see. So back to Genesis, verse 43, verse 11. So their father, Jacob, finally said to them, if it can't be avoided, then at least do this. Pack your bags with the best products. What kind of products? The best. The best products of this land. Take them down to the man as gifts. Balm, honey, gum, aromatic resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Also take double the money that was put in your sacks uh, as it was probably someone's mistake. Then take your brother and go back to the man. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. And so he says, go, but don't go empty-handed. Take the one who can save you and offer him your best. Offer him your best. See, when we seek his face, do we give him our best? Is our study time rushed? Is our prayer time self-seeking? Is our church attendance to checking off the list? Did it? Are we offering him our best? Point number three, pursuing the face of Jesus means offering him our best. Best is your blank. In Philippians 2.15, it says, so that no one can criticize you, live clean. Well, it, no one's going to criticize you if you're wearing white, right? Because they know you're clean. They you know you got any stains on you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Running your race to the point where you are pouring out your life for the Lord. Offering him not just your best, everything, you can have it all. And so Jacob says, take the best and lay it at the feet of the one who will save you. Verse 15, so the men packed Jacob's gifts and doubled the money and headed off with Benjamin. They finally arrived in Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his uh, manager of his house, these men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside uh, the palace Then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's uh, palace. He says, look, 
they were obedient. Now they will feast with me in my house. Verse 18, the brothers were terrified when they saw that they were being taken into Joseph's house. It's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time we were here, they said. He plans to pretend we stole it. Then he will seize us and make us slaves and take our donkeys. Yeah, I think the last thing I'd be worried about is the donkeys. <laughs> the brothers approached the manager of Joseph's house and spoke to him at the entrance of the palace. Sir, they said, we have come to Egypt once before to buy food, but as we were returning home, we stopped for the night and opened our sacks, and we discovered that each man's money, uh, each man's money, the exact amount paid was in the top of his sack. Here it is. We have brought it back with us. We have also have additional money to buy more food. We have no idea who put the money in our sacks. Relax, don't be afraid, the household manager told them. Your God, the God of your father, must have put treasure in your sacks. I know I received your payment. Then he released Simeon and brought them uh, out to them. The house manager received the payment, which means Joseph, the type and shadow of Jesus, paid it in full. Woo! That's good preaching right there. <laughs> paid it in full. Paid in full is your blank. Listen, this was not family discount. Oh, don't worry about it. Just give them what they want. The house manager's like, no, I received the money, which means he actually paid for it. Verse 24, then the manager then led the men into Joseph's palace. He gave them water to wash their feet and provided food for their donkeys. They were told they would eat be eating there so they prepared their gifts for joseph's arrival at noon noon uh in the hebrew represents uh uh light being shed on a situation it is the it's the light of day at at high noon it's you know it's, it's going to be light is being shed on the situation so in, in the hebrew culture when they the twice now it said at noon at noon at noon it's because light's going to begin to be shown on on a situation and so they don't know it's Joseph, and there's an invitation to come into the house, which uh, yeah, they, they kind of have to accept it, but it's more of a not accepting, but they have to come to terms with it, basically. And, and I, tonight I want to say that Jesus wants to be in relationship with us, but we must, number one, be obedient. Number two, accept the invitation. Accept is your blank. Yeah, but I didn't pay it. I, I didn't. No, it's been paid for in full. Are you willing to come with terms that the fact that he's paid it in full for you? And number three, mend the broken relationships. Redemption comes when reconciliation takes place. Verse 26, when Joseph came home, they gave him the gifts they had brought him. They bowed low to the ground before him. After greeting them, he asked, how is your father, the old man you spoke about? Is he still alive? Yes, they replied, our father, your servant, is alive and well, and they bowed low again. And so Joseph's first dream has now been fulfilled. Verse 29, then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother. Is this your younger brother, the one you told me about? Joseph asked, may God be gracious to you, my son. And so he sees, he sees that his, his brother Benjamin and the act of obedience has been fulfilled. Yes, I brought what you asked me to bring. Verse 30, then Joseph hurried from the room because he was overcome with emotion for his brother. <clears throat> he went into his private room where he broke down and wept. After washing his face, he came back out, keeping himself under control. Then he ordered, bring out the food. The waiters served Joseph at his own table, and his brothers were served at a separate table. The Egyptians who ate with Joseph sat at their own table because Egyptians despise Hebrews and refuse to eat with them. Joseph told each of his brothers where to sit, and to their amazement, he seated them according to their age from oldest to youngest. I, I, I love it. Now he's just playing games with them. Joseph is revealing himself to his brothers, but they still don't see it. And see is your blank. How often does God reveal himself to us and we don't 
see it. We're going to see uh, next week, in the next week or so, uh, we're going to watch uh, some video cl uh, clips of um, archaeological digs where they prove this actually took place. I mean, it's literally there. One of, one of the things they, they show is that uh, archaeologically and scientifically, they can't figure out why one pharaoh became so rich. Doesn't happen. It's impossible. It's like, oh, I can tell you how. It's right here. We'll look at that later. He's revealed it, and people don't see it. Verse 34, and Joseph filled their uh, plates with food from his own table. Whose table? His own. So, so they, they were separated from the Egyptians. They, they, they weren't worthy to sit with them. And he takes food from his table and, and puts it on their plates. Giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others. So they feasted and drank freely with him. You might be like, man, five times as much. Uh, five is the number of lacking. Lacking is your blank. They are together, but they're not reconciled yet. See, reconcil reconciliation takes time. Mending relationships takes time. It takes time to heal. It takes time to, you know, for those relationships to mend. Genesis 44, verse 1, when the brothers were ready to leave, Joseph gave them these instructions to his palace manager, fill their sacks with as much grain as they can carry and put each man's money back into his sacks. Then put my personal silver cup at the top of the youngest brother's sack along with the money for his grain. So the manager did as Joseph instructed him. The brothers were up at dawn and were sent on their journey with their load of donkeys, a loaded donkeys, not a load of donkeys. <laughs> Come on, guys, let's go. Um, but then they had gone only a short distance. They were barely out of the city. Joseph said to his palace manager, chase after them and stop them when they catch up when you catch up with them ask them why have you repaid my kindness with such evil why have you stolen my master's silver cup which he uses to predict the future what wicked thing have you done okay so we know he doesn't use the cup to predict the future okay but what's interesting here is he, he's 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 playing a game with them. He puts them all in order, like he's all-knowing or something. And they're like, whoa, how did he know our age, like, order? And then, and, and so then he puts the silver cup in there, and he has to raise the stakes of why the cup is so important. Well, we already know he knows everything. Oh, my goodness, we got his cup. When the pal, uh, <laughs> predict the future. All right, and so, verse 16, Judah answered, oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove? Uh, wait, did I skip a verse? Oh, verse 6. When the palace manager caught up with them, he spoke to them as he had been instructed. And when they were talking about his brother, uh, the brothers responded, We are your servants. We would never do such a thing. Didn't we return the, uh, the money we found in our sacks? We brought it back all the way from the land of Canaan. Why would we steal a silver or gold from your master's house? If you find his cup with, us, with any one of us, let that man die. Okay, stop talking, everybody. <laughs> and all the rest of us, my Lord, will be your slaves. Okay, whoever's talking, gag that guy. <clears throat> That's fair, the man replied, but only the one who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go free. They quickly took their sacks from the backs of their donkeys and opened them. The palace man manager searched the brother's sacks and the oldest to the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. When the brothers saw this, they tore their clothes in despair, and they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Joseph was still in his palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell to the ground before him. What have you done, Joseph? Uh, what What have you done, Joseph demanded? Don't you know that a man like me uh, can predict the future? It's like I know everything. I put you in order. I know what I'm doing. That's what I'm famous for. Don't lie to me. I mean, who's gonna lie to that guy? He knew there was gonna be a seven year famine. He knows the order they sit. Like I ain't lying to him. He knows everything. Verse sixteen. Judah answered, oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing for our, uh, us for our sins. My Lord, we have returned to be your slaves, all of us, not just uh, 
our brother who had your cup in his sack? No, Joseph replied, I would never do such a thing. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go back to your father in peace. Then Judah stepped forward and said, please, my Lord, let your servant say to the one, uh, one word to you, please, don't be angry with me, even though you are as powerful as Pharaoh himself. My Lord, previously you asked us, your servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we responded, yes, my Lord, we have a father who is an old man, and his youngest son is a child of his old age. Uh, his full brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him very much. And you said to us, bring him here so we can see him with, our own, uh, see him with my own eyes. But we said to you, my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for his father would die. But you told us, unless your youngest brother comes with you, you will never see my face again. So we return to, uh, to your servant, to your servant, your father, our father, and told him what you had said. Later, when he said, go back again and buy more food, we replied, we cannot go and let our, uh, young, unless our youngest brother goes, uh, go with us. We will never get to see the man's face. Again, the repetition that the guy is pointing out here if you, the, the, to see his face. Obedience is required. Unless your younger brother is with us, then my father said to us, as you know, my wife had two sons, and one of them went away and never returned. Doubtless he ha was torn to pieces by some wild animal. I will never, uh, and have never seen him since. Now if you take his, uh, bro uh, his brother away from me, and any harm comes to him, you will send this grieving white-haired man to his grave. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We are your servants. We indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. My Lord, I guaranteed to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him, if I do not bring him back, I will bear the blame forever. Please, my Lord, let me stay as your slave instead of the boy. Let the boy return with his brothers, for how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I cannot bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. Who sold him into slavery? Judah. And he's showing that he's changed he once had no regard for the father's heart, and now he's, he's, uh, he cares about the father's heart even to the place of self-sacrifice, and self-sacrifice is the blank. Protecting the father means putting his interests above our own. Philippians 1.21 says, For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go be with Christ, which, is, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, I, it's better that I continue to live. And point number four tonight is protecting the Father's heart means your life is no longer your own. Life is your blank. Your life is no longer your own. And that's kind of a weird uh, thing to think about. That my life does not belong to me. It belongs to the Father. Genesis 45, verse 1. So Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So uh, he was alone with his brothers, and when he told them who he was, he broke down and wept, and he wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brother, brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing in front of them. I, I love this. You're like, man, we're covering a lot tonight. I know, because you got to see the whole thing. Like, you can't just take a little nugget and four weeks later get to the end. Like, you got to see the whole thing. Verse 4, please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother. They haven't said anything. They were standing there speechless. So he says it again. I am your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt, but don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years. 
and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, a manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all Egypt. He's the one that has promoted me. He's the one that put me in this place. And so Joseph says, I've forgiven you. God has placed me exactly where I need to be. You need to forgive yourselves, and yourselves is the blank. You need to forgive yourselves. Whoever's going to play for me, if you want to come up as we close tonight. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Did you get that? His purpose. When, 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 when we are living life for his purpose, God, number five, when we pursue Jesus and protecting the heart of God, God can use can use and be glorified in every situation. Every is your blank. Tonight, I don't know what your situation is, but I'll tell you this, that when we are pursuing the face of Jesus, when we are protecting the heart of the Father, when we are pursuing the purpose that God intended for us, whatever the situation that you are in, he can use it to be glorified. See, we, we sometimes don't allow God to be glorified in our situations because it's got to be about me. But protecting the heart of the Father says we're putting his interest above my own. You know, tonight as we close, the question I have for you is, you know, we've said yes to Jesus. I mean, I hope so. I mean, I mean you guys are hearing a pretty deep study of the word, okay? So it'd be odd if you hadn't. But, but we've said yes to Jesus. You can have my life. But tonight, your situation that you are in, have you said you can have that? You can have that situation. Yeah, but the situation's not good. So give it to him anyway. You can have that situation. Father, I want you to be glorified in that situation. Verse 9. Now hurry back to your father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there's still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, look, you can see for yourselves, and so can your brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. Go tell my father, of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen. Then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. It's a powerful passage of scripture tonight. See, the current situation was not the end. God was able to use the situation for his glory, reconciling the relationships and bringing salvation to those who were obedient. Obedient is the blank. Tonight, are you willing to say, God, you can have my situation? Are you, are you ready tonight to say, I cast all my cares on you? I just want you to be glorified doesn't matter if I win. doesn't matter that if, if, if uh, justice is served for those who've wronged me. Are you, I just want you to be glorified. I want you to be glorified in my situation. You can have it all. Are you willing to say that tonight? Stand with me as we pray. Father, I thank you for tonight, God. I thank you for just the students of the word. 
And Father, I thank you how powerful your word is. So tonight we say you can have the situation. A thing that's been weighing you down, a thing you've been stressed about. You can have it. Jesus, be glorified in my life at all cost. Be glorified in my life. Father, tonight we, we ask we ask for white garments. Just right where you are. Father, we ask for forgiveness that covers all sin. We ask for the white garments that we can only get from you. Father, we pray for the the uh, the eye ointment that we can only get from you, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, and we would know the hope of the calling that you have on our lives, that we would pursue your calling even in our situations. See, Judah... He had no regard for the heart of the Father and went off and did his own thing and, and he was welcomed back. And so I want to challenge you. You may have been in a place in your life where you had no regard for the Father's heart. But it's not too late to start now. From here on forward, we say, I'm seeking his face. I'm going to protect the heart of the Father. Father, I thank you for the students of the word tonight. Father, I pray that this week as they seek your face, that they will experience you in a new and very real way. Your word says that seek and we will find, knock, and the door will be opened. So those that have been seeking breakthrough in their life, we, we, we command those doors to open. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.